who are a tennis player, to the Djokovic or Murray or Sharapova going on to Wimbledon centre court to play a final. How do you deal with that pressure? How do you welcome it? Right? How do you respond to it? And that's really what John is going to be talking to us about today. And he's going to talk about handling, preparing to handle pressure <coughs> in his environment, which is that way. Right, that's where he spends his time, up in a fighter jet, doing all kinds of crazy things, I think. Um, so he'll be talking to us for the next sort of 40 minutes or so, and I'm sure um, we'll, have, we'll have some questions for him at the end. But I'd uh, just like to give you a warm welcome, John. Thanks very much for taking the time to do this. Right, John Bond. Uh, good evening everyone, uh, John Bond from uh, 3 Fighter Squadron at RF Coningsby in Lincolnshire. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. When uh, MJ first told me I uh, would like you to uh, give a talk on uh, handling pressure and uh, your everyday day job, I thought, well, who's actually going to want to listen to this? So it's, uh, it's great, to, uh, great to see everyone here. Um, just a little bit about um, what I am going to talk to you about today. <clears throat> Um, a little bit, a little bit about myself. Um, I joined the RAF in 2006, so been in for uh, around nine years now. Um, continued fast jet training 2007 to 2008, and uh, since then I've still been pulling the, uh, the wool over the eyes of my instructors and uh, managed to go um, to the typhoon. Um, before that, I finished my training. I did it a little bit backwards to uh, to everyone else. Um, so I finished my training, I then went on to be an instructor on the Takano, which is a, a turboprop aircraft used to train um, fast jet pilots as they, as they go through. So I, I soon finished that as a student and then went back to uh, being an instructor on it. And I was there from 2009 to 2012. Um, I was then selected to be the Takano display pilot in 2012, so um, I went around the UK and Europe um, displaying the Takano um, to the public, uh, which was a great privilege. Uh, once I finished that tour in 2012, I then went to the Typhoon, converted to the Typhoon, and that's where I am uh, at the moment. As MJ alluded to, um, I also play tennis for the Air Force, but uh, that is becoming more and more difficult, uh, so it's uh, when I'm allowed, on, when I'm on a when I'm allowed basis, but uh, fortunately it <coughs> worked out quite good and allow me to uh, and allow me to come and play. MJ, is there an easier way of clicking through this? Perfect. Uh, so, what am I going to talk about then? First of all, the definition of pressure. We've all got, there are many types of pressure, pressures, but, and we've all got our own definition, but I'm just going to go straight to the, uh, to the Oxford English Dictionary for the, uh, for the top definition, if, uh, for want of a better word, and then we can relate everything I then talk about um, to this. And then going to go on to the, flat, the flying planning cycle. So, how do we prepare to deal with the pressure that we're going to potentially get when we're faced with the enemy when we go flying, or even on an everyday training <coughs> basis. Then talk about the airborne mission, the processes I go through when I'm, uh, when I'm airborne, uh, and how that is all related back to the planning process, um, again, to try and alleviate that pressure and turn the pressure into a positive. Uh, we'll then summarise, and then for any questions anyone has um, at the end. So, what is pressure? So, the good old Oxford English Dictionary defines pressure as an attempt to persuade or coerce someone into doing something. Now, this something can either be in a positive or a negative sense. However, in the worst sense, it could eventually lead to making a wrong, incorrect decision. So, as the uh, good inventor Alexander Bell said, before anything else, preparation is the key to success. And he followed on by saying it's better be, to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared for it. Are you prepared to succeed? If the opportunity you've been waiting for suddenly appeared, would you be ready to take that opportunity? And it all comes back to the preparation and uh, I will tell you about how we go about that on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis in the end. So you're probably thinking, well, what's this got to fly, do with flying? What's this got to do with your everyday job? These opportunities that Bell talk about probably don't come around very often. 
In the flying world, the advancement in adversaries' technologies will mean that the opportunity to gain an advantage, we may think we've got the superior jet, we may think we've got the superior equipment, but the opportunity to take advantage of the enemy's technology, which is forever getting better, are going to be few and far between. There's also complex rules of engagement. Um, if we did go to, to war properly, in a proper air-to-air -air war, then the rules of engagement, who we would be allowed to shoot, um, who we would be allowed to target, would be incredibly complex. We couldn't just go out all out World War II style and shoot anything we see on our radar scope. So there'll be lots of processes through ground agencies, uh, through air-to-air -air agencies as well, to be able to get the correct hostile declaration to be able to shoot. Also, the prevention of blue on blue, massively important. And you know, with the political pressures of, of the modern day, and uh, you know, the fluffiness of the fluffiness of everything, you know, we don't like to be seen to doing bad to uh, anyone else. The prevention of blue on blue would be key here, and therefore, again, to prevent something like that fratricide, um, the opportunity to take advantage of the enemy would be would be few and far between. So we need to prepare to t to make any gap. Um, in those opportunities, we need to take advantage of them, and we probably don't have a lot of time to do that as well. Does anyone know what blue and blue is? Does anyone know what blue and blue is? No, no. So, fashion so um, the good guys shooting the other good guys rather than the good guys shooting the bad guys. Oh. So, um, so, yeah, so fashion side there. And again, if the, uh, if the uh, IT works, Here's a little, a little snippet of something that I was involved in in October last year. Um, I was doing quick reaction alert duties um, at Coningsby. Uh, this is a, um, a duty that comes around every two weeks. Um, there's always two of you um, on quick reaction alert 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, and Fortunately, or not fortunately, it was my turn in this, uh, on October the 26th, I think, last year. Uh, we got a call that there was a, uh, an airliner not speaking to anyone heading towards London, uh, and we got scrambled, and this is the, uh, the fallout um, from it, if I can make the IT work. The first, followed soon after by a second, the sound of two fighter jets racing at supersonic speed. On their way to intercept a potential hostile threat, this is the Latvian cargo plane at the centre of that alert on the ground at Stansted Airport. The plane was escorted there after failing to communicate with air traffic controllers as it entered UK airspace. The two typhoons were scrambled from Ariette Collingsby in Lincolnshire. In a radio transmission, one of the pilots can be heard warning the cargo plane to change course. The fighter jets have been given permission to fly at supersonic speed to head off the cargo plane as it was nearing London. A map of the flight path clearly shows how close it got to the capital before being intercepted. For residents across Kent in particular, the sound is so important. We're understandably alarming. We were literally just doing our work as normal, and suddenly a massive bang came um, over Initially, I just thought, oh, God, it's you know, really down thunder. As air traffic controllers monitored the unfolding events, the Latvian cargo plane was ordered to follow the fighters to Stansted, the UK's designated airport for handling security-related incidents. With the threat level in the UK at severe, the authorities are on heightened alert. Repeated incursions by the Russians into NATO airspace has also increased tensions with British aircraft regularly scrambled to intercept rival military planes. We tend to fly alongside aircraft um, and uh, we'll take photos and we'll um, even you know, wave at the... Uh, Don't listen to anything she said, I do not know who this woman was. 
absolutely rubbish. Uh, the pilot crew does not wish to respond to um, their mistakes. Um, big both hands, yeah. The two yes. people on board the Lambie and cargo plane were all questioned on the ground at Stansted. It's understood they simply failed to switch to the proper radio frequency. The plane carrying car parts was allowed to continue its journey to Birmingham. Mark White Steinberg. Sweet. So, so that was that was something that happened last October, and although it came at no notice, uh, we literally got the call, went to the jets, got airborne. Um, it was the preparation beforehand, the simulator <laughs> training. Um, you know, we go through this scenario. Yeah, at least once a month in a simulator. Um, it was the preparation that allowed us to handle a potentially a very complex and potentially if we had shot down an aeroplane, then you know, let's let's not think of the consequences. But had we had done that, then the pressure the pressure to do that and also the pressure to to intercept that aircraft. It was at night. It was in bad weather. Um, it was the preparation beforehand that allowed us to do that um, safely and quickly as well. And I'll go on to that as we go through the, uh, the planning cycle that we go through before we go flying. So, um, typical sortie timeline then um, before we go flying. Uh, we do a very type of missions on the front line. Um, I won't go into the complexity of them now, but they do vary on a database database basis, and it doesn't always fit this timeline. But just to give you an idea, if we're planning to do a reasonably big mission involving lots of um, other aircraft, then this is the sort of timeline we will base ourselves on. So, uh, around 7.30 we'll have a MET brief, that will last for about half an hour. Um, we'll then go into uh, a mission snap-in, so a basic overview um, from our intelligence um, sources about what today's mission will entail, um, how many aircraft will be participating, uh, and what can we expect in the way of threat. Um, the mission commander, who will be uh, dedicated by the, um, by the mission planners, will then begin to start the plan, have about two hours to formulate that plan, which will then um, end up in a briefing to all the elements um, in the mission. Then about an hour and a half, the execution of the mission airborne, um, before ending with a debrief. So if you look at it, only an hour and a half actual execution for four or five hours of planning. So the planning cycle is much more than the actual execution itself. And that enable us to prepare to handle the pressure that we may get in this hour and a half here. This is what we, uh, this is what we, the mantra that everyone in the Air Force seems to use, the six Ps, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. Uh, remember that, and uh, whenever things are getting a little bit difficult, go back to the plan, did I prepare enough to be able to succeed here? So, how do we prepare to win the fight then? It all starts at step one. So the very first event of the planning cycle, uh, Met Brief. You must be thinking, well, okay, it's the weather, it's a nice day, it's about 20 degrees, sun shining. But it's actually a little bit more to that. How can we use the environmentals of the day to our advantage? So, where's the sun in the sky? Where would we want to be when we face the enemy, when we come to the merge with the enemy, uh, when we come face to face with them, where do we want to be in a particular sky? So if we come face to face them into sun, they're going to struggle to see us. So we need to know where the sun's going to bear at the rough time of our rough time of our fight. Also, where are we going to where are the contrails of the day? Every day, depending on uh, the pressure, um, the aircraft you will see contrails at different heights going up through the atmosphere. Where do we not want to contrail? If we're contrailing, you can see an aeroplane from 60, 70 miles away, and you go, wow. Well, He's in the contrails, we know he's there, we don't even have to look on our radio scope, he's there. So we need to know where the aircraft is going to start being visible to the enemy. How's the is this wind going to affect how we can stay airborne? Obviously headwinds, more fuel, more time, um, where is this going to be a factor? Similarly, 
a stronger wind coming towards the enemy, you're going to reach the enemy quicker. Similarly, um, the other way, um, if it's coming from the other direction for the enemy. Is the cloud structure going to affect weapons delivery? For example, if you haven't got GPS guided bombs, so fire coordinates straight to the bomb, you can drop in any weather, um, drop the bomb off and it will fly straight to the coordinates you've got on the ground. However, if you don't have that sort of bomb, you need to laser it in. And a laser doesn't work through cloud. So that could affect how you go about um, planning the mission. So all of this detail is, is all ratified in the very, very first step of the planning process. So from the off, we're thinking about the what ifs and planning to succeed. Also, we need to think, can we legally get to the area of operation within the aircraft's release to service? Is there going to be thunderstorms in the vicinity? Some aircraft have limitations on whether they can fly through thunderstorms. All of this is going to affect the overall mission success. And this needs then to be fed back to the planners, who may alter the task for us so that it can be achieved. Analyzing the big picture, we use something called the five T's. Timeline, task, target, threat. Building all these together in a planning process will then lead to the fifth T of a tactic to win. So using timeline, task, target and threat, they're not individual, they then all form one to create a tactic to win. You need all four of these to align and you need to consider all the what ifs in all four of these to enable the team to develop this tactic to win. And this is going to be form the main thrux of the, uh, of the planning cycle before we go flying. So now we're just going to analyse each of these individually uh, and how this relates to the, the forming of the tactic. So first of all, starting with the timeline. As ever, you never have enough time. No matter how much time you give yourself, you always seem to run out of time here. And I think that can be, you know, that can be um, detailed in, in many other forms of work as well. No matter how much time you give yourself, you're always up against it. So that just adds to the pressure. So we need to try and alleviate, alleviate that. Job allocation and delegation is probably the most effective way a leader, a leader can uh, manage his time effectively. So, what we would do is we give, we'd give each of the uh, members of the formation, each member of the package, certain jobs to do. Whether it's from the menial task of drawing a map, and trust me, when the computers are down and you have to go to uh, manual drawing maps, that takes a long, long time. Deconfliction cards, we're going to have loads and loads of aeroplanes in the same airspace. We need to know where everyone is going to be throughout the fight. So we have things called uh, sanctuaries which are different heights that everyone will flow to if they lose situational awareness. This is to keep everyone deconflicted and everyone safe. Liaison with external agencies. Not everyone is going to be in the plan at the same time. Um, they might be based at different airfields. They can't all be at the same place where the big mission planning is going. So we need someone to liaise with external agencies and coordinate uh, through them. We also have target planners. We need someone to tell us what, what are our targets for this particular mission. And they would have gone through all the, uh, the wizardry of making sure that our targets were suitable for the aircraft they'd given, to do, uh, given them to, and, and the weather is fit for that type of delivery. Probably the most important one is our intelligence officers who will give us the threat. What threat are we likely to face? Without the threat, and I'll highlight this later, there's no way we can we can have a tactic. We need to make sure we know our threat inside out, what effect they can have on our tactic. And it comes down to even the basic teas and coffees. This takes a long time, this planning process. <laughs> Although I like to uh, dehydrate myself before I go flying for obvious reasons. Um, you know, these just, these just add, you know, someone doing that just takes the strain away from, uh, from the main mission commander. Also, a big one, and obviously this, this is the one that most commonly get, for, gets forgotten uh, in the planning cycle is, can we actually achieve the task in the time that we've been given? Everyone's got this gung-ho attitude of, yeah, we can do, you know, get this big air tasking order with a load of targets, 
um, and a load of um, enemies to defeat. But actually, we've only got an hour and a half to do this, and we've only got fuel for an hour. So things don't match up. And it's amazing how many times this gets picked up right at the end of the plan. Um, so first of all, we need to actually make sure we can achieve the task in the allocated time frame. You also need to stick to the timeline. Lots of moving parts need to align to make the mission succeed. Failing to stick to the timeline on the previous slide creates an unnecessary pressure itself. The mission keeps getting delayed and delayed. You'll miss your time on targets um, and the whole team just feels the pressure. You can stick to the timeline religiously, then everything's nice and calm and you can get flying and get to the mission on time. Onto the task itself. We need to know what's been asked of us. What is the intent that the commander who's given us this task, what does he want? And what are in the implied task in this? It could be something simple as he want, you need to enforce a, a UN no-fly zone, um, but what are the actual implied tasks of this? The implied task is we need to stop any enemy aircraft getting through to this no-fly zone. How are we going to go about stopping that? And all this comes down to analysing the task. What assets do we have available to meet the task? It's no good if we're, if we're told we can expect 20 enemy aircraft, but we've only got four of our own to deal with them. Straight away we can go back and say, we can't do it, and we do not have the assets um, available. Also, are these assets equipped for, equipped for the task? Um, we might have 20 aeroplanes um, available to us, but if we're faced with um, a certain selection of ground targets, but none of these aircraft are fitted with air-to-ground weapons, we can't carry out the task. So it's matching the equipment to matching the task. And also, as mentioned before, for the timeline, do we have enough time to complete all the allocated tasks uh, given to us, or do we have to delegate them to another package, or do we simply have to turn around and say, no, we can't manage them? So, this all comes back to defining what it is you want or need to achieve. If you don't know that, then you can't develop your tactic, you can't execute the plan. On to the target itself then, so the, uh, the third of the five T's. We need to know obviously what it is, what is the makeup of the target. It's amazing how, um, how different targets build, uh, what they're made of, concrete, wood, how deep they are, and how large they are. This can all affect the weapons employment and how effectively we can destroy the target. Do we need to destroy it? Do we just need to damage it or do we just need to harass it? That's something else we need to, we need to um, develop with the target planners and again we'll allocate assets, bomb types to be able to achieve this. Do we have the weapons available to do this? Do we have the quantity of weapons available to do this? Do we have the aeroplanes to deliver the weapons? What constraints are there? As mentioned before, political pressures and collateral damage issues are huge nowadays. Um, we don't like to be seen to be destroying anything um, that we shouldn't be. Um, so collateral damage is probably the biggest constraint in, um, in weapons and bombing, and bombing plans. So we need to be 100% sure uh, that there are no civilians around or anything that is not the target itself and whether our bombs are going to affect um, any surrounding uh, environments. And as mentioned before, the weather has a big effect on this. And this again goes back to the Met brief, which then feeds into the target plan. So all of these are starting to link up now um, to develop a, a, a strategy for winning. Enemy posture, are the bombers going to be faced with an air threat as they go into their, uh, they go into their target area? And also aircraft numbers. If we've got 10 targets to hit, but only 4 aeroplanes, each with 2 bombs each, we can't do it. So all of these get fed back in the planning stage. Probably the most important threat, uh, the most important threat is the threat, um, to develop the tactic. Now, I put that on the bottom, just so if you're thinking at this point, well, I don't fly planes, so it doesn't really matter to me. But you can view this in everyday life as your competition. So whether it be on a tennis court, whether it be a business adversary, um, 
it, it can all be related, and I'll come to a tennis example later on in the presentation. So what do we need to know about the threat? Um, is it in the air, or is it on the ground? Do we have uh, weapon system operators on the ground with an air to sur um, surface to air missile to be able to shoot us down, or are we just faced with other airplanes with missiles coming to shoot us? What are the numbers? Obviously, if there's only five of us and ten of them, we're in a losing situation already. So we either need to get more or cancel the mission altogether. What are the aircraft loadouts? Have we got um, have we got aircraft that can deliver bombs simultaneously and missiles, or have we just got dedicated um, air-to-air fighters? What are their equipment capabilities? What sort of radars have they got? How far are they going to see us um, from our safe land to their um, we call it red land, so or en enemy territory? When, how far are they going to detect us out? When are they going to be able to employ their missiles on us? How hard do they train? Are they well educated? Um, do they train to the same standards as us? Um, all of this is contributing to how we are going to fight them in the end. What are their aircraft serviceability rates? Um, they may have 30 aircraft on their books, but only, if only five work, then we can adapt our tactic um, to meet that. Obviously, we won't have to, uh, to put so many aeroplanes um, at risk. So this is all coming back to um, knowing your threat and how important it is to know your threat to be able to develop your tactic. And you can view this as your competition in all walks of life. And as mentioned, you can't build a tactic for your success if you don't know who you're up against. So, onto the tactic itself. Driven by the task, timeline, target, and most importantly, the threat. Once all this has been acknowledged, so we're, at, we're, four, we're on 15 now, we can now develop the plan and brief the plan to the team. Um, if we don't brief the plan to the team, we can't execute the tactic. We don't know what we're facing. So it's implicit that everyone is brief and everyone knows their roles within the team. There's, there's nothing worse than having a great plan formulated in these three hours that you've got and then the execution is let down by the other people not knowing what, um, what you've got to offer and what you've planned for them. So it's implicit that it is carefully and precisely briefed because there's a lot of different, if we're doing a big mission there'll be a lot of different aircraft, um, some from different countries, some with um, language barrier issues, um, so it is absolutely vital that the message gets across to be able to, be able to implement a successful tactic. Questioning and check of understanding, again vital in a, uh, a different language environment, um, especially when you've got different nations that are used to training in a slightly different ways yourself. Um, so questioning and check of understanding, just as, it was, just as it would be in an everyday workplace, is vital to, to successful execution. So that's effectively the plan. So they are the five T's that we would go through um, in those four or five hours we've got in a 1G environment. Uh, before we go and, uh, and fly the mission airborne. So what, what do these, um, what do these four, uh, five T's actually enable us to do? What, what is their purpose? The key thing, it makes us look at the what ifs. So it enables us to look at the most likely and most dangerous courses of action. It enables us to plan for success. Um, and most importantly, it enables us to analyse the what ifs. Just look at that, uh, the last um, section there. This is all occurring in a nice air conditioned room. Um, we're all sat at body, body weight. We're all just at walking pace. We don't want to be thinking of this when we're flying supersonic at 40,000 feet in formation with about 25 other aeroplanes. We need to make sure we have analyzed all the possible problems we could face with the enemy and our own aircraft, um, and once we've analysed the what ifs, the pressure is then reduced when we're at uh, when we're at height and speed um, when we're performing the execution airborne. So again, preparation is the key here. We don't want to put 
that negative pressure that I mentioned on the first slide on us when we're flying at Mach 1, 40,000 feet. So on to the uh, airborne execution. We just want to be focusing on the safe operation of our own aeroplane. The prior planning and preparation and all the mental effort can now just be focused upon executing the tactic. So what we'll do when we finish the plan to walking out to our aeroplane, we'll allow probably about an hour uh, from the finished plan to getting airborne. And in that time, we'll be carrying out all our pre-flight checks, um, putting on all our equipment, and uh, making sure the aeroplanes are serviceable, ready for us to go flying. Um, in this time, and I tend to, we tend to walk probably about 15 minutes too early, just so it's almost, the cockpit almost becomes your, uh, your sanctuary, because you've left all the manic of the planning process behind, it's just you in your jet now. You've got all the plan, you've got the plan written down on your kneeboard, and you know exactly who you're going to be speaking to, when, and how you're going to implement the tactic. The last thing you want to do is last minute, oh, I've forgotten this, or oh, we should have thought about that, because that just then increases the pressure, and before you're even airborne, you're flustered, um, and it does not lead to a good start to the sortie, just increasing that pressure. So all this preparation um, is allowing you to become relaxed and able to execute safely and uh, in a relaxed manner. So having analysed the majority of the wattage, you can adapt, adapt to the threat without the pressure of having to think on the hoof. You are reducing the potential of the unfavourable coercion into letting pressure make you carry out a poor decision. So back to that first slide and the definition and the quote from Alexander Bell, the, uh, the negative pressure, by effect effectively planning, you are reducing the potential of this unfavourable pressure making you execute the wrong decision, or indeed a poor decision. On to debrief. Probably the, uh, the most important part um, of, the, uh, of the mission. So we've flown it, hopefully it's been a success. Um, we now need to, uh, to share the lessons learned. I think this is it's the most important part of the cycle, but probably the most neglected, I think. And I think we neglect the analysis and the debriefing of our everyday activities um, probably as well and I think it's probably the most important part because if we don't learn from the mistakes of the previous mission then how are we supposed to make the next mission a success and I think you can relate this to everyday life. Learning from mistakes owning others is the key to future mission success. It's almost a competition in some briefs, uh, debriefs or it should be a competition um, who can own up to the most mistakes? It's it's uh, it sounds sort of strange, but it's almost it's almost you want to try and develop the others and other pilots around you. So admitting to your own errors, however significant, um, there may be something that someone else can draw out of that. So uh, we always, it always goes on with everyone admitting to uh, messing up, but actually you look at the big picture and they're not actually that big a deal. But you never know, someone could take a little nugget from, from your own mistake and him not to make it in the future. This is one that is also quoted uh, regularly during missions. It's nine times out of ten a mission fail is all due to the planning and preparation leading to not executing your winning tactic. Um, if you don't fly the plan, then you're probably not going to win, uh, and that and that we see a lot. I was in a, uh, in a mission two days ago, and for whatever reason, we hadn't the uh, the enemy aircraft decided to come up with this tactic that we hadn't thought about in the plan. And um, although I understand you can't plan for every eventuality, we just hadn't thought of this at all, and uh, it ended up in being a bit of a disaster. But um, but. That was all down to not thinking about this what if, and actually we were really rushed in the plan, we had other constraints. Um, but being rushed, not sticking to the timeline, led us to miss this, um, this vital um, event. And all the clues were there for us to take from previous missions which our simulated um, enemy had, had done. But because we didn't have the time, we were under pressure, we didn't think about this, and uh, hence we, uh, we lost some ground during that mission. So. Um, 
all due to the planning and preparation. As mentioned before, always the most useful and sometimes forgotten part of the mission, debrief. Uh, and again, even on you relate it back to the tennis court, analysing a match that you played, um, what you did well, what you didn't do well, what you can develop on next time, um, it all comes back to that as well. Uh, and normally it's due to preparation. Why did I falter in the third set? Right, I didn't have a good meal, I didn't drink enough water, I uh, didn't do enough gym work in the, uh, in the off season to be, make me fit for that third set. So um, all about analysing and learning from the mistakes. Again, if the IT works, I'm just going to show you a uh, short video from uh, an exercise that I went on in February. Now this was an exercise in Oman, it was a uh, heavy weapons detachment uh, in Oman. This is a video of myself uh, and another aircraft uh, doing a bombing run together. Um, a couple of the pressures we faced here was um, we were very tight on fuel, so the, the range where we dropped the bombs was about 200 miles away from our airfield. Um, we had four bombs between us to get rid of um, at this, in this time. Um, so the biggest, the biggest constraint we had in this mission was fuel. Having enough fuel to get those four weapons off and come home safely. Um, but it was in the plan that we decided to come up with a specific um, order of bombs and how we would do it that enabled us to get four bombs off in a very short space of time to have enough time to come back. Also, um, I, my aircraft decided to, uh, to break on my first pass, so as I went to release the bomb, the, uh, we call her Bitching Betty, she started shouting at me, uh, saying that a particular system had broken um, on my aeroplane. So I had to keep the bomb on the jet, um, go through, and this is a routine failure as well, so again we'd brief this in the mission plan, um, so although it's a high pressure situation anyway, dropping bombs, the pressure was reduced by me or the formation having briefed in the pre sorty briefing, right, if you get this failure, all you need to do is do this, do that, and the jet should be fine again. So fortunately, when this happened, it's like, right, we briefed this, we planned this, this should be an easy fix. Um, but just, you may not, uh, the volume might not be great, but uh, if you've got any questions, just follow up on. I'll try and talk you through. So this view is from my laser de designation pod. So it's a pod on the underside of an aeroplane. Um, and that there is the laser spot in the middle. And these are the targets there. So it wouldn't create here. So that's my target there. And so there should be some volume. Hmm. So this is now the, uh, the laser is lasing the, uh, the target, so the bomb will just follow, the, follow the, uh, the laser beam onto the target. How far away are you actually, John? Can you say how far or how high up are you? Uh, I'm at so 15,000 feet. So it's zoomed in pretty? Yeah, this is, this is zoom right The zoom is pretty high. So just um, just putting this into context, the five T's that, that I talked about and um, and how we can relate them to an everyday activity. 
obviously tennis common theme here at Holton uh, and I play it as well. Just come up with this um, small example uh, of how we can relate the five T's planning process um, to your game of tennis. So timeline, well, as uh, Nick Volateri said, that um, I didn't, you know, you don't, you don't lose a match, you just run out of time to win it in. Um, so the, t the timeline is within your own physical limits, um, your own physical fitness, how long you can stay out on court for. Um, obviously you've got a certain amount of games but it's up to you how, how long you can stay out for and, um, and weather the storm if you are in a storm. Um, task to win your next service game for an exa as an example. So what's my target if I really if you know, I want to stand a good chance of winning this service game? Service game? Well I need 80% of first serves in. What's my threat? The opponent's got a really good, really good return. How am I going to uh, negate that threat? Well, I know from intelligence, from people watching him in his last game, he doesn't like the body serve, he doesn't move his feet very well, um, so, so his return is not effective with a body serve. So what tactic am I going to have? Well, I'm going to put the body serve, do I need a grip change to make that happen? Do I need to adjust the throw up? Uh, what's the backup plan if suddenly he has, a, uh, has one of those days where he's actually moving his feet and he's getting to the body serve, what's, what's my plan too? Um, it might be for the out wide serve, the T serve, whatever. This is all what you're coming up, coming up with in your planning process, whether the planning process between change of ends or planning process uh, before the match even starts. Into the execution, don't allow your plan to be compromised by rush, <coughs> rushing, lack of fluids, lack of preparation. Um, you need to make sure that the pressure is reduced by enabling you to have those five T's completely squared away in your head. The preparation has allowed you to become in a, in a low, lowered pressure environment, but you don't want to compromise that lower pressure environment by letting external factors like rushing, lack of eating properly, lack of fluids, lack of fitness, um, not enabling you to execute that tactic accurately and effectively. So, hopefully that has been a little bit of in an insight into, uh, into what goes on in the flying environment in the RAF uh, and how maybe you could use some of those um, points from the 5T's planning process to use in your everyday life. So just to summarise, you can't remove the pressure but you can assist in reducing its negative effects by preparing and preparing properly. Preparation and considerations are the what-ifs increase your capacity during execution. Got more, you've got more capacity if you are faced with a changing environment, so, oh right, that hasn't quite got to plan, my opponent's done this, but it's all right, I considered this in the planning process, therefore I don't really have to think about how I'm gonna combat this because I've already thought about it. I've got capacity to do other things um, at this point. This increasing capacity allows you to deal with pressure in a more balanced and considered manner. And I think everyone agrees if everyone's thinking clearly, um, you execute um, more effectively um, and more efficiently as well. So that's me. Um, hopefully I haven't gone on for too long. But uh, if anyone's got any questions, please fire away. <laughs> John, just going back to the, the, the picture that you had with um, the, the big plane. You're, you're in the. This is you. Yeah. In in the, this is the typhoon. Yeah. Yeah. And the big the big plane that was that's that was a. Like the Russian bear. Is, it? is that what you're on? Uh, yeah. That one there. No, there was a. There was something. Is that star? Is it star? Nice that one there. Um, so this is a that is a tanker aircraft. It's called an IL-76. Um, we've actually just done a, an exercise with the Indian Air Force. Um, so the Indian Air Force brought over their tanker. So that's their air to air refueler. You can sit on the back. Got some oh, there. Yeah. So it refuels the these two aircraft, which are called SU-30 flankers, uh, Russian-built aeroplane, and um, now we fuel off off the back of that. Yeah. 
So a conventional aeroplane will have these on the back of the wings, on the front of the wings, because um, it needs to be manoeuvrable. It has um, it has a little front. So they're called flap, uh, they're called Elon, so they're um, maybe more manoeuvrable. Controlled pitch. Well, mate, what's um, what's the biggest thing that you sort of pull on down no. experience or sort of trend or whatever that affects you and helps you handle pressure when you're on the, in that type of environment? What, 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 what's the key things for you? you know, like the, the key, the key thing for me is not being rushed. As soon as I feel rushed, as soon as that timeline is slipping away, uh, that's when I feel the pressure. And it's only self-induced because I think, right, I'm feeling rushed, I'm missing something here. There's something I've missed in the plan because I've been rushed. Nine times out of ten, there is. Um, but for me, time is time is key. If I if I have a if I have a relax relax lead up to a sortie, relax um, lead up to a mission, I tend to execute it a lot better. Um, when I'm rushed, um, things tend to get missed. However, if you're rushed but you've done this mission a long time, you, you practice this, what you're going to do a lot. You sometimes can use that um, sort of rush demeanour as a an adrenaline. It turned into an adrenaline adrenaline rush, effectively, and you actually end up performing a bit better. So it it depends what sort of rushing it is. If it's a rushing but you're unprepared, then that's bad. If you're rushing but it's a reasonably routine exercise, then you you can turn that into adrenaline. Do you have skills for getting your heartbeat down? No, no, it just, um, I mean, the only time where the heartbeat from the, from the very first video I showed you from the, in, during quick reaction alert, where literally you've got, your, there is no notice um, of, of something that's going to happen. So literally you'll get the call, buzzer will go off, you'll run to the aeroplanes and within X amount of time you're airborne. And it's very quickly. Um, the great thing about that is that you don't have any time to think at all. So, which is sometimes, sometimes, the, but the reason why that's all right is because the preparation has been done months before in the simulators, and it's just ingrained. It's just a natural, a natural process. So, you don't have time to think about it until. I mean, on that particular one. Throughout the whole mission, I thought I was in the sim. It was that, it was, you were that, it all happened so quickly. It was only when I landed that I thought, it's just gone on there. Um, it's, you know, when I was airborne, I was just, just thinking I was in the sim. I didn't, you know, didn't realise there was another aeroplane there in front of me. Um, it was, it was a quite surreal experience, but it was because of all the training and preparation that the pressure didn't uh, didn't affect you didn't have time to feel the pressure really because it was just a routine um, event. Did you? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Like, just thinking about you as a tennis player. Yeah. Have you seen a difference in the way that you play also as a captain since you have kind of had ultimate training and stuff? Um, you know, can you demonstrate that kind of change? Or is it something you did naturally anyway? Uh, yes and no. It's um, I think the, the difference between the captain and not being the captain is that, uh, and you get it when you're leading these missions and stuff. You you need to set an example. So um, you know you need to you need to make sure that you're not in this scenario. Your knowledge is 100% correct because if you're briefing the rest of the team and you're briefing a load of rubbish, then they're not going to believe it, they're not going to fly a tactic, they're not going to win. Um, similarly, if you go back to the tennis scenario, if you don't play matches in the off-season, if you don't strive to be the best you can be, then you can't tell anyone else to be able to do, to do that. So, for me, that, that's the leading by example bit. Um, so, yeah, so... I'm not sure whether that really answers the question, but... No, it's fine.
So I'm just, just linked to that then. Um, you'll be at Wimbledon, Wimbledon next week. Mm -hmm. So John and these guys down here will be playing the inter-services, which is Army versus Army, Navy and uh, Air Force playing against each other at Wimbledon. It happens every year. It's, it's, um, it's quite a pressure situation. You know, and I've seen, I've seen without, without sort of, um, you know, putting the fear into these guys, I've seen guys crumble in, in that type of situation, purely because of the, 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 the competency level. And just, you know, clearly you're very, very competent, confident because of the competency level that you've developed through all that training. So do you, going into kind of a situation like next week, would you feel like a mere mortal like the rest of us? <laughs> or will you, will, you, will you be able to take some of these things to on, on into that situation? Yeah, well, again, it, go, it goes down to the, I mean, this season, I've probably played more tennis than I have in the last 10 years, so I feel better prepared to go into it. Yeah. It's it's when you, haven't, when you haven't played something for a while, or and then you go into it, you've got the pressure because you know subconsciously that right, I haven't played this for a while, therefore I'm going to be rubbish at it. And then you just get yourself into a psychological spiral. Whereas if, you, if you've done something more often, you're more current at something, I think that just, again, helps. You won't get rid of the pressure, obviously, because it, and the pressure is a natural, a natural occurrence. But it, um, but it will just aid to relieve, you know, 30, 40% of that pressure that you, that you might experience. So, and again, it goes back to preparation in yeah. sporting. And that's where you see the crossover with like managers like Mourinho, and who are just absolutely mad on preparation and yeah. the detail that goes into it. And, and, it's, and it's not just you as well, it's your, it's your team around you. So your, in, in the flying case, your intelligence analysis, you know, you can't just go on court you can't prepare correctly if you don't know what you're up against, if you don't know your threat, you don't know what the strengths of the person or competition that you're facing. Um, the more you get of that, the less pressure you feel, the more knowledge you have, therefore the more prepared you are, and therefore the better your execution will be. Do you have any personality trait that you have to lock away? in order to perform your best. The, the, ra the raging oh, shooter. <laughs> These are things that we don't yeah. know about. Them. Um, I think most of us are quite stable. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, no, there's no... Yeah, when I'm, when I'm rushed, normally, if I'm tired as well, you can sometimes just, you can sometimes either miss stuff, get angry at stuff. You know, the little things again, like, um, you know, someone, someone in the office the other day flashed because there wasn't enough whiteboard pens to do his brief. Um, and that was because he was rushed, he didn't have enough time to go and make sure they were there before his brief, he didn't. And little things like that, and I find myself, if I'm tired, that's, that's a big one for me. Um, just the tiny little things that you think, oh, that's irrelevant, utterly irrelevant. There's not a ruler for me to write my brief on. You know, little things like that just drive you into drive you into a bit of a frenzy. And again, you know, harping on about it, but that and then adds to the pressure. You then got the more pressure on delivering the brief, and then the more important stuff will get missed because you're worried about the, the small stuff. So, the personality trait that I have to rein in is my frustration when I'm tired, and that happens a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Freddie, have you got any questions? In your jet, how fast does it go? How fast does it go? <laughs> They're really that's, important. That's the best stuff. question yeah. of the night, yeah. The most important stuff. Um, it can go, it varies, but about over a thousand miles an hour. So to drive to drive from Coningsby to here is what two and a half hours. Yeah. How fast can you fly it? So to give you an example, that intercept um, over London. So we intercepted him over the middle of London. Uh, it took us six minutes to get to Lincolnshire. So if you're driving, it took you two and a half hours to leave six minutes. 
It's pretty good. There was no traffic in my time. That's the way they travel here for you. Yeah. And just for, the, just for the youngsters, John, when did you first become, when did you decide I want to be a pilot? When did you decide I want to be a pilot? Um, probably when I was about four years old. Um, <laughs> I used to uh, go on holiday, buy them you know, models or whatever, and my parents would used to get really annoyed because I'd ruin the lounge or the balcony or whatever with bits of building, pretending to be a terminal, bits of Lego for a runway. Bits of that. So my parents put on with a fair bit when I was younger and unfortunately again I said I've been putting the wool over eyes people and I don't quite not sure how uh, how I've got to where um, flying this thing. Um, but it's a it's a it's a real privilege and um, it's a great job. Love it. Mm. So. Hello. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're all this is Rihanna's question. She wants to know what's the biggest thing you've blown up. Biggest thing I've blown up? Uh, probably the video you saw there. We, we don't, fortunately, we, uh, obviously we don't, we don't blow up many things in this country. Um, and that's by accident. But uh, I was, um, the typhoon isn't uh, at the moment in operations in Iraq. So um, it's primarily a, an air-to-air -air fighter. But it, it is a multi, it is a, it's classed as a multi-role jet, but still we've got the Tornado, which is the, primarily the air-to-ground um, attacker. Um, so um, we only go up um, to, when we go on exercise, normally to the desert, because we can't mess up there, and if we do mess up, then a camel gets in, nothing like that. So it's, uh, it's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, so that crate that you saw, the wooden box, is the biggest thing I've thrown up. I've been really fortunate as well to um, fire um, an Azram, which you can uh, which you can see on there, which is a um, which is an air-to-air -air surface. Uh, sorry, an air-to-air -air short-range missile. Um, so I, fl um, I fired one of those about a month ago uh, in the Outer Hebrides, um, so off the Scottish West Scots coast, um, against a little drone that was flying around in the sea, and uh, so we fired that off in a nice controlled environment. Um, and that was how best I can describe that was imagine a garden rocket on fireworks night, the noise that makes, but hearing it from inside a cockpit and seeing it go off your left hand wing. Um, that was that was a uh, that was quite an experience. But fortunately we don't have to do that on a day to day basis and use it, but it is there and uh, if we do. Great. Alexa, is it satisfying when you play something like that? Is it satisfying? Yeah, it's very satisfying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's um, as I said, it's a pressurised situation because the consequences if you get it wrong, is, you know, you don't want to think about. But um, when it when it goes right, it's um, and you see, you, know, you see the the bomb exploding on the. Uh, on the pod, and then you know you've definitely got the right place, which is which is more relief than satisfaction. Like good, that is where I wanted it to go. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's a satisfying part. Okay, hey, well, John, John just mentioned, you know, what a privilege it is for him to do what he does and the, the, the job that he he loves, and it's been a real privilege, I think, just listening to him talking to us tonight. He's given up. Uh, a lot of time in a, clearly what's a very, very busy uh, job. Um, although having said that, he now does have four days of tennis ahead of him. So, uh, you know, if you, if you want to join the RAF boys and girls, yes, the WRAF, um, what a fantastic job it is. You get to play a lot of sport. And look at these physical specimens here. Just to, uh, <laughs> well, look at that physical specimen. <laughs> But it's, um, just a big round of applause to John. And, uh, and just to thank you all for coming tonight and hope you found it useful, beneficial, and uh, lovely to see you all. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.